All right, thank you. It's good to be here. So um, a big question that we're very interested in at uh, Google is what are the applications of a fault-tolerant quantum computer? We're obviously investing a lot into developing such a device, and we want to understand uh, where does the value come from. And perhaps uh, one of the best examples that, of course, has been discussed uh, very much at this meeting is uh, application to computational chemistry and other Hamiltonian simulation problems. And this is a very good example because, first of all, there's a very sound scientific basis to expect that quantum computers can provide advantage for this problem. And secondly, it's a problem for which there's much uh, economic and human value. Um, but of course, we'd like to have many applications uh, for quantum computers. And in particular, it would be great if we could find uh, quantum advantage for problems in machine learning or optimization, because these are so ubiquitous in industry and have so much value. Um, however, as compared to the um, Hamiltonian simulation and computational uh, chemistry examples, the um, capacity of quantum computers to help in machine learning and optimization is, I think it's fair to say, less well understood, even though much good uh, research has been done in these areas. And so what I decided for this talk, I won't attempt to give an overview of all the different uh, research projects in quantum algorithms uh, at Google. Uh, I felt that would be impractical. But if you want such an overview, you can look at this website. Instead, I will give a deep dive into one specific project, uh, which is titled Optimization by Decoded Quantum Interferometry, uh, which I'm working on with um, some collaborators. And the underlying motivating question here is, can quantum computers achieve exponential speed up for optimization problems? And we're especially focused on um, exponential speed ups, or at least cubic or quartic speed ups, because ultimately we have to have a big enough speed up to overcome the overhead of slower clock speeds and error correction in quantum computers as compared to classical. And optimization problems are very tempting in this regard because they have the right basic uh, characteristics where you might hope for a quantum advantage. These are problems that are, in many cases, compute limited as opposed to input-output bandwidth limited. And so that's the right kind of target to be looking for. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is that many optimization problems are NP-hard. And by complexity theoretic arguments, we do not believe that um, quantum computers or classical computers should be able to find exactly optimal solutions uh, for all instances of these problems. But that doesn't mean there's no room for quantum advantage. Uh, in particular, a type of quantum advantage that could exist is that maybe a quantum computer could find an approximate optimum that's not absolutely the best, but very good, and maybe the one that it finds efficiently is out of reach for classical computers, that finding an equally good approximation might take exponential time classically. And so whether that exists, even a single example of that, has really been, in my opinion, one of the major open questions in quantum algorithms research, which has been studied all the way back uh, starting 30 years ago when quantum algorithms research really took off after Shor's algorithm was discovered. And I think, um, although uh, there are many interesting results. I think it's fair to say that the basic question is, uh, has so far been not resolved. And so a number of um, approaches to this question have been proposed, such as adiabatic and QAOA methods. And it's often helpful in quantum algorithms to have some uh, physical intuition to help make the connection to quantum mechanics. And those are based on using Hamiltonians as an analogy for cost functions to make that uh, connection. In our new uh, approach that we've recently um, devised, our point of connection is completely different. Instead of thinking about energy landscapes, we think about interference of waves. And um, we try to design our algorithm so that the waves will interfere constructively on the very good solutions and destructively on the suboptimal solutions. And the, the thing that allows us to do this 
is the observation that for many of the optimization problems that are well studied and important in practice, the cost function has a Fourier transform, which is actually very sparse. And so uh, in the end of the day, what we do is we prepare a quantum state where the amplitudes are given by some polynomial of the cost function. And the cost function itself is a sum of terms and ultimately defined in terms of a uh, matrix. And the difficulty of the, of the uh, problem is determined by the structure of this matrix. And so it turns out that we can prepare this quantum state um, if a certain kind of decoding problem for classical error correcting codes can be efficiently solved. And um, what this means is we take an optimization problem and we convert it into a decoding problem. And you might ask, does this really help us? Uh, because decoding problems are also NP-hard. So we've taken one problem and converted it into another hard problem. But the real point is the quantitative details. So we have proven a theorem which tells us, as a function of how many errors we can correct, how many clauses we can satisfy in the original optimization problem. And the interesting thing about this formula is, in a way, it allows us to do experimental research uh, on this algorithm, even though we don't have large enough quantum computers to really run the experiment with real quantum hardware. There's, there's actually some, uh, kind of an experiment we can do, which maybe that's a counterintuitive ex, uh, statement, but what I, let me tell you what it means. So what we can do is we can generate an optimization problem, say generate this matrix, uh, B. We can run any decoding algorithm we want on the corresponding decoding problem and find out experimentally how many errors can we correct with this heuristic. Then on the other side, we can try our standard kind of... Uh, classical heuristics, simulated annealing, and so on, and find out how many clauses can they satisfy. And then by this formula, we can compare these two numbers and find out, does the quantum algorithm win? So um, once we do a little bit of theory work, that allows us to do the rest by experiment. It becomes a heuristic that we can really test. So what do we find when we test this heuristic? So one of the nicest examples to test on is random max uh, exclusive ORSAT, which is a, a very standard and widely studied problem uh, in optimization. It's not, oops, uh, it's not quite uh, directly a practical problem like, say, traveling salesman or something, but it's sort of a, a simplified version of, of a problem you might see uh, in real life. And um, the idea is you have a set of linear equations mod 2, you just want to satisfy as many as possible because you can't satisfy them all. That doesn't exist. And uh, one thing I should mention is this problem includes as a special case the quadratic unconstrained binary optimization that's made famous by um, D-Way, for example. So it's a, this is a well-studied standard problem. Nice test bed for algorithms. And the interesting thing is usually this matrix B is very sparse in practice. And it turns out when we do our reduction, this means the parity check matrix of our code is sparse. And in that case, there are very good decoders we can use, such as belief propagation. So this gives us some hope. And so what happens when we try this? So here's what happens if we try kind of standard off-the-shelf uh, decoders, a uh, belief propagation decoder on some instances uh, that we generated uh, randomly. And we compete against uh, simulated annealing and various other kind of standard um, general purpose classical algorithms for this problem. And we are able to achieve a better fraction of clauses satisfied than any of these general purpose algorithms. Although eventually we found that if we made a very customized classical algorithm for these specific instances, that still was able to eke out a win over our quantum algorithm on these instances. But we took this as encouraging evidence that uh, with further effort by the scientific community, optimizing decoders for the kinds of codes that arise from this reduction, maybe we could get an outright win uh, by quantum computing. The second example we looked at is a slightly more structured problem, which is, in a sense, a curve fitting type of problem. So we have some points or some ranges that we want to intersect but we want to intersect it using a low degree polynomial. So the number of adjustable parameters in this polynomial is a lot less than the number of constraints. And so we can't exactly hit all these, but we want to hit as many as we can. 
And so this is uh, um, a little bit more specialized than the Max Zor set, but it's maybe also not such an exotic problem. It's, it, it's really a curve fitting problem. And um, it turns out that when we use our quantum algorithm to convert this curve fitting problem into a decoding problem, it ends up being a very favorable code uh, for decoders. It ends up being a Reed Solomon code, which has basically the best decoders uh, possible. It can very efficiently uh, um, correct a very large number of errors. And as a consequence of that, via our formula, which I showed earlier, um, we are able to satisfy a very large fraction uh, of these constraints. And in this case, as far as we can tell, there's no classical algorithm that we've been able to find in the literature or devise on our own, which runs in polynomial time and satisfies this fraction of the constraints in the original problem. So as far as we are aware, this is an exponential quantum speed up for an optimization problem, um, which is something that you know, we've really been searching for as a community uh, for a very long time. And of course, the, you know, the broader question about can quantum computers help with specific um, optimization problems of, uh, that arise in practice in industry uh, remains uh, a big question mark. But at least it sort of gives us a, an existence proof that um, uh, there can be, as far as we can tell, at least some optimization problems where quantum computers uh, yield exponential advantage. Now, of course, it always remains possible that some clever classical person will discover a better classical algorithm. Uh, so that's true for all quantum speedups, essentially. So there's a few um, remaining um, points uh, that I would like to um, make about this. One of the um, things that we hope from this work, which uh, we actually haven't gotten the paper up uh, posted yet, but we're just polishing it now. It should appear on archive.org uh, within the next one to two weeks. So if you want to see details, uh, that will be possible quite soon. And one of the questions we were not able to resolve is if we just generate these kind of sparse random instances, do we get um, a exponential advantage over all algorithms, not just against the really general purpose ones. And I think uh, uh, with enough attention from people at universities, other corporations, uh, government laboratories, and internally at Google, we can hopefully uh, find such an example if it exists. And using this framework we've put out, we have a systematic approach for um, addressing this question. Of course, there remain other approaches, adiabatic and QAOA, which make steady progress to understand questions such as these. Um, and in particular, there's a big body of scientific literature and expertise in the world that we can draw upon because decoding of error correcting codes is a very well motivated um, and well studied problem. And so we can try to mine that body of uh, knowledge and expertise in order to improve the performance of these quantum algorithms for optimization now. And lastly, um, as a more philosophical point, I, I would say that um, there's always a natural temptation to uh, say, well, we've studied these questions about quantum algorithms uh, for so many years, and we have not found an example of a speed up for optimization or some other area and to conclude, okay, it's case closed, we should give up and, and move our attention elsewhere. Or there can also be the opposite tendency to say, well, of course quantum computers will eventually help with everything and it's a matter of details. And what I would um, argue is that it's important to not jump to conclusions too soon and to keep in mind that perhaps some of the best applications that we find that will be for quantum computers are the ones that we have not uh, discovered yet. And so with that, I would like to um, conclude and thank my collaborators and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we have a few questions. Um, 
and, and please continue to submit them uh, using, uh, Sada will probably put up the QR code in a second. Um, but the first question is, uh, do you see the time difference when quantum advantage will be achieved by areas like chemistry, optimization, machine learning, et cetera? Oh, yes, that's a very good question. So one thing I would point out is that this uh, specific algorithm, unfortunately, is a lot less NISC friendly than, for example, the adiabatic or QAOA approaches. Um, because these decoders, you ultimately have to implement them reversibly using, say, Toffley gates or so on. And it's really going to be a high depth quantum circuit. Um, so that's uh, certainly a reason to continue um, research on these lower depth circuit approaches, such as QAOA. Those ones, um, uh, as I said, have, are pretty hard to analyze uh, theoretically. Um, I would say uh, maybe a hope there is as the hardware progresses, we can do more, a lot uh, more extensive real world experiments with actual quantum hardware for things like QAOA. Excellent. And then, um, yes, oh, oh, yes, and then so uh, I would say that puts this at a somewhat more distant timeline for implementation as compared to even computational chemistry. It's more on the order of at the point with the size of machines that would um, allow you to run Shor's algorithm and things like that. Thank you. We have a few more questions. Uh, how does the number of sparse entries affect the performance of the method? Yes. So it turns out that for LDPC codes, there are, no, there are ways of computing um, how many errors you can correct using belief propagation as a function of the sparsity of the parity check matrix. There's a numerical method called density evolution which can do this. There's not a closed formula, but you can run a computer program for a few minutes and find out. Of course, you can also just run belief propagation and experimentally see how it performs. But density evolution is nice because it actually gives you the asymptotic uh, theory answer that the experiment should converge to as the problems become larger and larger. But there's not a closed form solution. There's just a numerical method and also tables of uh, numbers that you can find in standard textbooks. Um, wasn't, it, uh, wasn't it theoretically proven that the low, uh, low autocorrection binary sequence problem can be accelerated using QAOA? Uh, OK. Well, this is a, I should be careful of my statements about there's no known example of things because there can always be examples that uh, you overlook. I don't want to make definitive comments about that one because it's been a long time since I read that paper and uh, I, don't, I want to be careful not to say something wrong, but, but thank you for suggesting that example. And maybe we'll try a couple more. Um, is uh, DQI related to Yamakawa and Zandri algorithm? Yes, it's actually pretty closely related. So the Yamakawa and Jandri algorithm is not identical, but it's similar in spirit. It applies to the regime where instead of a system of equations mod 2, you're working over an exponentially large modulus. And in that case, the query complexity of the problem is exponential. And that's how they make this provable query complexity separation. Um, in our case, we're interested in a case where the query complexity is kind of trivial because that's what's, I think, more motivated by industrial optimization problems. So the downside of that is that then we can't prove a separation because we're talking about computational speedups and not query speedups. But on the other hand, um, it's a little closer to kind of industrial practice of things you might want to solve for scheduling and routing problems and so on. OK, thank you. One final question, uh, I guess. Um, uh, how about scaling to problem size? Shouldn't it be exponential, I think, is the, is the question. I'm not sure I'm reading it right. Oh, yes. So in this case, the dominant cost of the quantum algorithm is just the um, reversible implementation of the decoder. So if you have a decoder that runs in, say, a number of steps, which is quadratic in the um, number of variables, for example, then that will be the kind of scaling of the algorithm. 